You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. So a few weeks ago, I went fishing with my brother-in-law and one of his friends up on the St. Lawrence River. And one of the highlights was when I felt this sudden tug on my line. And I have to tell you, whatever I hooked, it was pulling back with all its might. It was the epic battle of man versus beast. I should note that because we were in freshwater, I knew it couldn't be a whale. But this thing was definitely gigantic. So I let out a little line in an attempt to reel in whatever was on the other end. And I did this over and over, slowly pulling my catch closer and closer to the boat. And my biggest fear is that I would get pulled overboard and into the water, but that didn't happen. Anyway, after a long struggle, I managed to reel the fish into the boat. And it was a monster, without a doubt the biggest fish any of us had ever seen. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. That's way over the top. The reality is that the fish that I caught was fairly small. In fact, it was the smallest that any of us had caught the entire time. But I tell this over-the-top story on purpose, and that's because history is filled with fish stories. You know, tales of the giant one that got away. And as you can probably imagine, after collecting offbeat quirky tales for more than 30 years... I've accumulated quite a few fish stories myself. So today on the podcast, I've selected five fish stories for your listening pleasure. And yes, they're all a bit more unusual than the typical big one that got away type tales. So don't go anywhere. You're about to hear those fish stories plus several non-fish stories, today's retro sponsor, and the question of the day. They're all coming up next on today's Useless Information Retrocast. I am Steve Silverman, and this is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information. So let's start the retrocast off with a question. Did you know that smoking is good for your digestion? Well, of course not. Today we know this is absolutely false. But beginning back in 1936... R.J. Reynolds ran an advertising campaign for its Camel cigarettes that claimed that they supposedly aided in digestion by increasing alkalinity. And for the next few years, they would get the endorsements of athletes, movie stars, and even ordinary people to back up their claims. By using catchphrases such as, for digestion's sake, smoke camels, they are gentle on your throat, and they never get on your nerves. These ads suggested that Camel cigarettes were far better for your health than all the other competing brands. Of course, this all proved to be a bunch of hooey, and in 1951, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, they issued a cease and desist order to R.J. Reynolds that prohibited them from making any claims that the cigarettes aided in, quote, digestion in any respect, unquote. But today, I just want to focus on one of the ads that they ran. It was published on page 3 of the March 29th, 1937 edition of the Herald Press. This particular ad focused on the daring feats of Paramount newsreel cameraman Al Mingalone. The text reads, quote, Al Mingalone never knows where the next assignment will take him. Whenever news is breaking, he's there grinding out film, heedless of danger. Sure, I get many a tight spot, says Al but I calm my healthy nerves and good digestion to see me through. I smoke a lot, camels every time. They don't jangle my nerves, and that saying, for digestion's sake, smoke camels, is made to order from me. Camels give me a grand feeling of well-being. And the ad continues. Yes, with fine-tasting camels, digestion gets off to a smooth start. The digestive fluids speed up, alkalinity increases, you feel at ease. As steady smokers say, camels set you right. Well, what Al could have never imagined at that time was not only would he be filming the news, but he would be the news. You see, on September 28th of that same year, Al had been sent to the Old Orchard Beach Country Club in, where else, Old Orchard Beach, Maine, on an assignment to do some, quote, house hopping with weather balloons. And the idea was incredibly simple. Al would be strapped into a harness and lifted high into the air by some oversized hydrogen-filled balloons. So armed with his Bell and Howell IMO camera, he was safely strapped in and then gradually lifted by the buoyancy of the balloons. Everything went well and Al soared to about 25 feet or 7.62 meters off the ground. 
Once he had shot his footage, he safely returned to the ground to swap out his film for a new reel. But Al was a daring cameraman and he wished to go higher to get a better view. So fellow cameraman Phil Coolidge, now this is the guy who dreamed up this harebrained scheme, he decided to add five more balloons to Al's harness. Well, that did the trick. Al soared higher and higher until the tightrope pulled taut. And then... It snapped. Al and a cluster of 32 weather balloons, they just took off skyward. So both Coolidge and Thomas Bauman, who was a locker boy at the country club, they gave chase. And Bauman got within arm's length of the rope's end, and then he suddenly tripped and fell. He missed. But he quickly jumped back up and he continued in his pursuit, and he came close again to grabbing it, but was unsuccessful. Well, by this point, Al and the balloons, they began to rapidly gain altitude. Luckily, a Catholic priest named Reverend James J. Mullen had come prepared. He ran to his car and he grabbed a shotgun and fired two shots at the balloons. I should note that it's unclear if he hit any of the bags, but Al, he just continued to go higher and higher. Well, it wasn't long before he appeared as a dot in the sky and the wind began to carry him away. Estimates placed Al's elevation as high as 1,000 feet, or 304.8 meters above the ground. Al later described what happened. I'd entered the lower bank of a quick-rising fog and couldn't see a thing. I tried to pull myself up the 10 feet to the balloon line. Part way cramps grabbed me, and I stopped. A sudden squall struck, I was jerked backward and dropped to the end of my harness. Having lost 12 pounds of ballast, I shot skyward again. My clothes were wet. The air was cold and raw. I must have been about 700 feet off the ground. After nearly an hour had gone by, I saw a car. I heard a ping, then another. There was a hissing sound. I began to descend. I would later learn that the priest and some other men had hopped in a car and given chase. They finally caught up with him and the priest fired two shots which punctured three of the balloons. Al safely came to the ground at a farm in North Kenny Bunkport about 13 miles or 20.9 kilometers from where he had begun his flight. Wow. Amazingly, his Bell and Howell camera was found in the mud and the film was then developed and Al was awarded the best domestic newsreel scene of the year by the National Headliners Club. Of course, Bell and Howell wanted to take advantage of this, so they ran a full-page ad for the latest IMO camera in the January 1938 publication of American Cinematographer. Now, there's a big image in this ad of Al tethered to his balloons, and to the left, in big letters, it says, IMO unharmed by 800-foot fall. It then, of course, goes on to describe the ordeal and why one should purchase one of their cameras. And as one would expect, R.J. Reynolds ran an ad for Camel Cigarettes in the October 22, 1937 issue of Life magazine, and it made note of Al's accomplishment. Quote, Al Mingalone, crack newsreel cameraman, says, When news breaks, I have to be on the spot to film it. Many a time, for days in a row, I've been kept on the run. When I'm tired, I get a lift with Camel. Right around the clock, it's camels for me. They're in a class by themselves for mildness. Al would eventually transition into television work, but nothing could ever top his death-defying balloon flight. He was 86 years old when he passed away on January 9th of 1991. Ten-year-old Janet Noski found herself in a bit of trouble on Thursday, August 2nd of 1951. That's because the blonde, blue-eyed girl decided to embark on a journey to Honolulu from her home in Highland, California, which is near San Bernardino. She decided to do it alone. Somehow, young Janet had managed to travel over 60 miles or 97 kilometers to the Pacific Electric Station at 6 and Main Streets in Los Angeles. As she stepped off the bus, a special agent approached her and stopped Janet from proceeding any further with her planned trip. Little side note is that the building is still there, but the trains and buses that used to stop there, well, they're long gone. 
and just how was she going to pay for this? With the $42 she had secretly taken from home, in other words, she stole from her parents, and of course she planned to use this money to buy a ticket to board a plane to Honolulu. But things didn't go as planned. Instead, she was escorted to the Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau while the police contacted San Bernardino authorities. As Janice sat upon her suitcase that she had filled with sundresses and swimsuits, she explained, I heard about Honolulu, so I just decided to go there. Besides, I've always wanted one of those grass hula skirts. And Janet proudly recounted a past trip to Chicago by plane, but upon further questioning, she admitted it had actually been a train journey, and that one was also cut short after a short distance. A policeman noted that Janet lived with her mother Anne at 388 East Patton Street in Highland, and that her father Harold was a patient at the San Fernando Veterans Hospital. And as the officer shuffled through some papers, Janet asked, Are you going to check if I've done anything else wrong? Well, the press never followed up to see if she ever did do anything else wrong, but I did. And what I uncovered was that Janet had a rap sheet about a mile long. No, not really. I'm just kidding there. What I did find was that she made the news two other times. The first story appeared in the San Bernardino County Sun on May 25th of 1950. It told of how eight-year-old Janet had been treated the previous day at the county hospital for a snake bite. She'd been bitten while playing near her home, and luckily the snake proved to be non-venomous. Then, four years after her attempted Honolulu trip, Janet was once again in the news. This time she was living in St. Joseph, Missouri, where she had been born. It was reported on November 12, 1955, that 14-year-old Janet and 13-year-old Emma Brown had left home the previous afternoon and had not been seen since. And when questioned, the parents said that they knew of no reason why the two girls would want to run away from home. Now, if I had to give a guess, I'd say they were headed for Honolulu. There was no follow-up to the story, but I think we can assume that the two were located safely. Janet, who preferred to be called Judy, eventually became a traveling home physical therapist, and she was 58 years old when she passed away on February 19th of 2000. Judy was survived by her husband of 30 years, Jack Lawless, and her two sons. You know, but I just can't help but wonder if she ever did make it to Honolulu. If you were to go to 3109 Century Boulevard in Southgate, California today, you'd find that it's home to Esteban's Liquors. But back on Thursday, February 19th of 1953, it was the location of a small neighborhood grocery store. It was on that day that Howard and Shirley Bailey sent their five-year-old son Danny to that store to pick up some groceries. And the family lived right around the corner at 10631 San Jose Avenue, so it was little more than a hop, skip, and jump for Danny to make his way to the store. And his shopping list was quite short. It included a loaf of bread, apples, oranges, and some bananas. As Danny stood at the checkout register with his groceries, a bandit brandishing a gun entered the store. And for some unknown reason, that mean bad man, he ordered the store owner, Rand Hill, into the back of the building. Well, that was an incredibly stupid mistake on the thief's part because Rand, he ran to the phone and called police. Meanwhile, the bandit is left out front with young Danny. But Danny, you know, he's a kid. He wasn't too concerned. He said later on it was just like watching a television show. But Danny could see that the gunman was getting a bit nervous and was about to make his escape. And that's when he saw Danny's fist clenched around the dollar bill that his parents had given him to pay for the groceries. So the bandit snatched the bill out of Danny's hand and he made a run for it. What the bandit didn't know was that Danny's parents had really given him $1.50, which is about $17.65 today. They had given him a dollar bill and two quarters, and Danny had outsmarted the crook, Danny said. I still got them quarters. I hid them under the bread. Danny's story made the front page of the Los Angeles Times the next day, and he was treated like a hero by his class at the Stanford Elementary School. He then proceeded to tell his story to his classmates. 
he had a real gun. He then explained how he had hidden the two quarters from the bandit. I just put them under the loaf and nobody knew it. And in the end, nothing was lost. That's because Grocer Rand Hill came by their place and gave them a bag of groceries to make up for their loss. But Danny's mom had only one concern, and that was for the safety of her son. Thank God he's safe. You know, there are quite a few artists out there who have sold over 100 million records. That includes ABBA, Garth Brooks, Eminem, the Bee Gees, the Rolling Stones, Madonna, Elton John, and I can just go on. Yet only three artists have sold over 100 million records worldwide as both a major part of a group and solo. That means, of course, while they were in the group, they sold 100 million records as a combination of albums and singles, and then they repeated that same feat as a solo artist. So can you name all three of those artists? And I think one will pop into your head immediately, but can you name all three? Well, hang around for a bit, and I'll reveal their identities at the end of this podcast. Fresh, the new cream deodorant presents David Harding, Counterspy. Washington, calling David Harding, Counterspy. Washington, Calling David Harding, counter spy. Harding, counter spy. Calling Washington. David Harding, counter spy, is brought to you by Fresh. Fresh, the new cream deodorant that stops perspiration worries safely. Switch to Fresh to be sure. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to that part of our program known as Be Fresh or Be Fired. (laughs) Yes, the Be Fresh or Be Fired department. Maybe you might want to call it the Be Fresh or Be Lonely department. Well, anyhow, it's a quiz corner where a fresh answer is always welcome. First question. Why do you refer to 4 o'clock in the working day as a time when you're apt to come up against the deodorant deadline? And the answer? Because when you're working, an embarrassing deodorant failure is more likely to happen toward the day's end. When you're out on a date at night, 10 o'clock is another sort of zero hour. But why be worried? Switch to that new cream deodorant fresh, to be sure. Second, a man's question. Is using fresh a sissy thing to do? And the answer? Well, fresh is a big seller among GIs and post exchanges all around the world. That's plenty answer. Which brings us to a question frequently asked. I get conflicting advice from people I know on how to be sure of personal daintiness. I'm confused. Well, friends, as many famous beauty editors and authorities on good grooming can tell you, modern science has the answer. And fresh brings it to you. In fresh you get the benefit of the most effective perspiration-stopping ingredient known to science. Fresh contains an exclusive ingredient. Fresh cream deodorant stops perspiration worries completely and safely. It's safe for you and for your clothing. It's creamy and smooth, not sticky, doesn't dry out, and it's never gritty. So it's a pleasure to switch to fresh, to be sure. That commercial for Fresh Deodorant is from the July 25th, 1945 broadcast of the espionage drama series Counter Spy. This particular episode was titled The Case of the Dog of Dynamite. The show was first broadcast on May 18th of 1942 on the Independent Blue Network, which became the American Broadcasting Company, or ABC, in 1945. Counterspy completed his 15-year run on November 29, 1957 on the Mutual Network. But of the approximately 800 episodes of Counterspy that were broadcast, less than 9% of the recordings are still known to be in existence. Now, as for fresh deodorant, there really isn't much documentation available on its history. It was manufactured by a company known as Pharmacraft, and the active ingredient in the deodorant was sodium zirconium lactate and they did introduce a stick version in 1953. The company was renamed Pharmacraft Laboratories in 1960 and was then sold to Wallace and Tiernan in 1964. But that's not the end of it. Wallace and Tiernan in turn was acquired by the Penwall Corporation in 1969, 
and that later became a subsidiary of the whiskey giant Joseph E. Seagram's and Sons. Now today, any remnants of Pharmacraft, if any exist, they're owned by Prestige Consumer Healthcare. The only Pharmacraft brand name that Prestige still uses, and at least it's the only one that I recognize as having been a Pharmacraft product, that's Ting for Athlete's Foot. I should note that just about every online retailer shows it being out of stock, which suggests that it may have been discontinued, but I can't be certain about that. And now, as promised, it's time for some fish stories. And I'm just going to read these word for word as they were originally printed in the newspapers. And the first tidbit for today was published on July 17th of 1902 in the Nashville Banner. The headline reads... Health was bad, fish in stomach, special to the banner, Dresden, July 17th. And I should point out that's Dresden, Tennessee. A peculiar but true fish story comes from the vicinity of Public Wells, a few miles west of Dresden. Mr. McGee of Public Wells has been in very bad health for some time, and though given the best medical attention, no reason has been assigned for his continued illness. He did not get any relief until one day last week as he was seizing with a coughing spell and began vomiting, and it was found that he had vomited up a small-sized catfish. The fish lived some time afterwards and had regular old catfish fins on its back and sides. Mr. McGee has been rapidly recovering ever since, and there is no doubt but that the fish in his stomach caused his illness. Our second story was published on page 17 of the Star Phoenix on June 27th of 1946. The title on this one is Strangest Fish Story of the Year. Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, June 27th, Canadian Press. Here's the strangest fish story of the year, and it's true. It was brought to Lethbridge on Wednesday from Waterton Lakes by A.G. Ballum of Lethbridge and R.W. Kellogg of Vancouver, along with the 26-pound Mackinac trout they caught Sunday without line and without hook. Just for your reference, 26 pounds is around 11.8 kilograms. Mr. Kellogg hooked a small fish and put the net in the water to land it when there was a silver flash and the big one, intent on grabbing the little one, dashed into the twine. Both men grabbed the net and soon had the 26-pounder threshing about in their boat. To make the story complete, the trout was the biggest taken from Waterton Lakes this year. Next up, we have a story that appeared in the Akron Beacon Journal on December 9th, 1949, on page 46. The headline reads, This goldfish sings, says custodian. Smithfield, North Carolina, United Press. Life in a bowl has made one of her goldfish quite a show-off, says Esther Radford. He sings, she claims. The secretary of the Chamber of Commerce admitted she kept hunting for a cricket or some insect in the office until she noticed the little fish seemed to be putting on an act. Miss Radford said the goldfish swims on its side while performing, and if the audience is appreciative, switches to a vertical position and turns up the volume. The Chamber of Commerce manager Charlie Parrish won't call it singing, but he vouched for the fish's vocalizing powers. Quote, Actually, it's more of a chirping sound the fish makes, he said. Next up, we have a story from January 11th of 1951. This appeared on page 14 of the Mirror News. The headline reads, Fish nips man for lunch, man nips fish for dinner. Edwardsburg, Michigan, January 11th, Associated Press. A man got caught by a fish here and Davy Quinn Jr. has a leg full of teeth marks and two witnesses to prove it. Quinn and two friends, James Bigelow and Richard Howard, were ice fishing on Eagle Lake Monday. Quinn speared a four-pound pickerel, and four pounds is around 1.8 kilograms. Suddenly, he burst from his shanty with a yelp. The pickerel had embedded its sharp teeth in Quinn's leg and was hanging on with an iron-like grip. It took several minutes to pry its mouth open with sticks. First time a fish ever put the bite on me, Quinn chuckled. But I got even. I put the bite on him at dinner. 
And our last little fish story for today is from December 26, 1957. Again, this is from the Akron Beacon Journal and appeared on the front page. Headline reads, Fisherman is sunk, and so is his shack. Minneapolis, Minnesota, Independent News Service. B.E. Jones is such an avid ice fisherman that he built a $1,000 ice fishing shack for use on Lake Minnetonka. Now, $1,000 is roughly $11,200 today. Jones of suburban Robbinsdale equipped his Dreamfish Palace with thermostatically controlled heat, gas lights and cooking stove, bunks, a cupboard, a table, and easy chairs. He moved the house to a spot where the lake was covered by a 6-inch ice sheet. And 6 inches is roughly 15 and a quarter centimeters. Jones, who had counted on almost everything except thaw, went fishing Christmas Day and learned his dream house had sunk 27 feet underwater. And that's roughly 8 and a quarter meters down. So earlier in the podcast, I'd asked you to name the three artists who have sold 100 million records, both as a significant part of a group and as a solo artist. Were you able to come up with the three names? My hunch is that many of you came up with the most successful of them all, and that is Paul McCartney. As a member of the Beatles, they have sold over 500 million records, and their biggest hit was 1963's She Loves You. Then, during his solo career, he moved an additional 100 million more records, and his biggest solo hit was 1976's Silly Love Songs. Okay, so that one's really easy. Do you know the next one? Well, next up we have Michael Jackson. As a member of the Jackson 5, and of course they later became the Jacksons, they sold an estimated 150 million records worldwide. Solo, the King of Pop, has supposedly sold over 500 million records, second worldwide only to the Beatles. The Jackson 5's best-selling song was 1969's I Want You Back, while Michael's best-seller was 1983's Billie Jean. Interestingly, if measured by weeks on Billboard's Hot 100 chart, 1983's Say Say Say, a duet between the two men, ranks as Jackson's most successful single and McCartney's second most successful single. Which leaves us with number three, and this one I think people may have a problem coming up with. That is Phil Collins. As a member of the group Genesis, their worldwide record sales came in right at the 100 million mark. Then as a solo artist, he moved an additional 150 million units. Now, the group's best-selling single was 1983's Mama, and Colin's biggest hit solo was 1988's A Groovy Kind of Love, which I have to be honest, is not one of my favorites. I should add that the sales numbers reported by the record industry and other sources are all over the place, and there really isn't any truly reliable data. In other words, don't take what I've said in terms of sales as the gospel. Just a quick reminder before I bring this episode to a close, and that is that I'll be giving a talk at the Canaan Historical Society this Sunday, July 28th at 2 p.m. It is totally free, so if you find yourself anywhere near Chatham, New York, just come on over and say hello. I will be presenting a few of my favorite stories there. Now, if you would like to come, the talk is being presented at the Canaan Historical Society at 14 Warner's Crossing Road in Canaan, New York at 2 p.m. this Sunday. It's an old church. It's a beautiful old building. Again, it's 14 Warner's Crossing Road in Canaan, New York. The Useless Information Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network, so be sure to visit airwavemedia.com, and there you'll find a curated selection of some of the best podcasts out there. As always, thanks for listening, and take care, everyone. Bye.